Can you hear me in the back okay? Great, thank you. Good evening. Welcome to our second day two of our retreat for our Lenten season with Father Kevin Joyce. We want to thank Father Kevin for coming back, as promised, and, um, and thank him for leading us in this retreat. Uh, as always, uh, we want to always surround this whole time in prayer. We want to welcome those who are joining us live stream and on Facebook. Uh, and I've had so many comments that even on Facebook and on YouTube and our parish website that we were able to really enter into prayer and deep uh, union with God and partly to do with you, Father Kevin, but partly to do with, mostly to do with Jesus fully present. And so as we begin our uh, time today, I'm going to invite you to please kneel as we now uh, welcome Jesus. Salutaris hostia, quecele pandis hostia, de la premut hostilia, caro verfer Semperna gloria, qui vitam sine termino, no visto nec in patria. Lord Jesus, we call upon your holy name. God saves us, merciful God, to save us who are in so much in need of your mercy in this time. So as we enter more deeply into prayer today, we ask that you would bless Father Kevin, your son, that he, inspired by you and your Holy Spirit, might place in us your spirit, that same spirit that filled all the saints who have gone before us and you while you walked on earth. Time in prayer, as we speak about prayer, as we practice the prayer, as we pray, may you be glorified and honored forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Good evening, everyone. I welcome back to our second and final evening of this parish retreat. If you'd like a little more of this retreat, you can come tomorrow and Thursday in Spanish. <clears throat> Tonight, the plan will be the following. After a reading from the Gospel of John, I'm going to give a second series of instructions about how to practice the Jesus Prayer and what not to do, so kind of do's and don'ts. Then we'll have a, a period of meditation together, all practicing the Jesus Prayer. And then we will have uh, the final sec segment will be what happens as a result of regular practice of contemplative prayer. The Jesus Prayer is one example. But any good method of contemplative prayer, Lectio Divina, Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, like uh, uh, Jesus' prayer, there are predictable consequences that we see throughout history in the writings of the great spiritual masters who themselves were experts in contemplative prayer. Before I begin, in case you wanted some further reading in this, uh, in this area of our tradition, and you want to know more specifically about the Jesus' prayer itself, where it comes from, the theology behind it, the the, some of the great spiritual masters who have taught it through the ages. There's a book that's called simply The Jesus Prayer, and it's written by a monk of the Eastern Church. He doesn't give his name. A monk of the Eastern Church. We actually know who it is. He wrote it anonymously, but we know that it is actually Father Lev Gelet, a, pri a priest of the Eastern Church. Very well done, um, very e readable. And if you want to know more about the great tradition from which the Jesus Prayer stems and so much of our Catholic and Orthodox spirituality stems, which is the desert tradition of the third and fourth centuries, those great spiritual masters and master psychologists, the desert fathers, and there were mothers among them as well. This little book, very it's only about 140 pages, it's called Heaven Begins Within You. It's a very well done book, very readable. It's one of those rare books that's deep and very readable. Heaven Begins Within You, subtitle, Wisdom from the Desert Fathers. And it's written by a Benedictine monk from Germany who is also a psychologist, Anselm Gruen, G-R-U-E-N. So you can get these on, online or at any Catholic bookstore. We're going to begin with a couple of passages from the Last Supper Discourse of John's Gospel. I began with this, this uh, section of John's Gospel last night with chapter 14, when Jesus speaks about praying in his name. Now, I suspect the apostles didn't know what he was talking about when he said, if you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. What did that mean to them? Like, it's likely they didn't really, they certainly didn't have a full understanding of that. And just so that they would realize how important this new teaching was, he repeated it in different ways uh, throughout the Last Supper, chapter 14, 15, and 16. Each chapter has uh, sections dealing with this, this new teaching. So let me read to you from chapter 15. First of all, he says, in words that sound similar to what we, what we read in chapter 14, he says, It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. There it is again. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And what did he say just before this, which is connected, he says, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. And so the bearing fruit, he's, he's implying here, is going to happen especially, that you're going to do something beautiful for God. I'm going to do something beautiful for God as parents, as professionals, as teachers, as retired people, whatever is our particular station in life. We're going to do something beautiful for God if we pray in his name. And we're going to go more deeply into that this evening. Now again, the apostles probably didn't know what, he, what did he mean by that. Well, 
in that same chapter, chapter 15, there's another line that helps to explain what he does mean. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I remain in his love. And then related to that, he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. Again, this extraordinary promise. He doesn't, at this, at, in this verse, he doesn't say pray in my name. He simply says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. So this is really an interpretive lens through which we can see more clearly what does he mean by praying in my name. It's if we remain in him, if we live in him, if we abide in him, and his words are lively in our awareness, if we read his words and meditate on his words, then what happens is that moves us to living in him more and more and more, and our prayer becomes increasingly powerful Eventually, to the point where he promises that whatever you ask for, you will receive if you are fully abiding in him, living in him. So that's chapter 15 of John's Gospel. And just in case the apostles were still wondering, what is he talking about? Again, later on during the supper, he says, and this is chapter 16, verse 23, he's talking about he says, I will, you're now in anguish. You're now in anguish. He's just prophesied that he's going to die the next day. And, of course, that's devastated them. And so he says, so you are also now in anguish, but I will see you again. So he's prophesying the resurrection. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. On that day, you will not question me about anything. Amen, amen, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. So this is the third and final time that he uses this enigmatic phrase, ask in my name, or ask the Father in my name, and you will receive whatever it is you're asking for. And so you notice it's a slightly different context this third time when he's, he's referring to the sadness that the disciples are feeling because he's just announced that he's going to be crucified the next day. But then he's also prophesying that they're going to see him again. Now, of course, they don't know what that means at that moment. But three days later, they'll know because he appears to them as the risen Christ. And then he indicates that they're going to be praying in a new way now. Once Jesus has risen from the dead, there's going to be a new way of accessing a contact with God. And it's going to be praying in my name, praying in the name of Jesus. He is going to be the risen Christ, available everywhere in the world at all times. And insofar as we know him, insofar as we love him, insofar as his words are in us, we're going to be living more and more and more in him, and our prayer is going to become increasingly powerful to the point where whatever we ask for is going to be given to us. Now, you may just think, well, this is just kind of a, kind of a, a pious wish. No, this is the reality. When you read the lives of the great saints, who were just people like you and me, but who took totally seriously, eventually at least, took seriously the, the Christian life, they lived it, Eventually, they lived it fully. And St. Teresa, one of the most famous women in the history of Christianity, St. Teresa lived in the 16th century in Spain and is probably the most uh, influential woman in the history of Christianity next to the Virgin Mary. She found out she, that after you know, several years of practicing contemplative prayer and getting deeper and deeper into her relationship with Jesus Christ, she was almost surprised in this book she wrote called The Way of Perfection, she says, isn't it amazing that this little nun of St. Joseph's Monastery is, uh, is, feels like she's almost lord of the elements. Whatever she asks for is given to her. And this is the kind of promise that uh, Jesus makes to us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and everything else will be given to you as a matter of course. So to seek first the kingdom of God, as we, looked, as we discussed last night, is to seek God's lordship over my life, my thoughts, my feelings, my attitudes, my actions, my decisions. And insofar as I'm sincerely and humbly asking him regularly, what do you want me to do? And looking for and, and waiting for inspiration, looking for inspiration in the word of God and in the tradition of the church. The more we do that, the more we're going to be getting answers. We're going to be getting nudges from the Holy Spirit, often through feelings that grow stronger or weaker the more you pray about something. For example, say you're, I mentioned this at one of the masses recently, you're, you've got this young couple that are thinking of getting married. And they, they're really in love with each other. They feel they're in love with each other. But they're not sure, maybe one of them is not quite sure whether or not they should marry. And so what I tell couples like that, or anybody who's making an important life decision, if you're in a regular practice of daily prayer, then at the beginning of your prayer, present your question to the Lord. In this case, say it's the young girl. She's not sure if, if this guy really uh, is for her. And so I say, okay, you, in your, as you begin your morning prayer, say you're doing the Jesus prayer or reading the scriptures as your prayer or doing, uh, going to daily mass, at the very beginning of your prayer, you present your question to the Lord. Lord, do you want me to marry him? Do you want me to marry him? Is he the one? And then you just leave the question in his hands, kind of like mailing an envelope. You put the envelope in the mailbox, and then just go on with your prayer. You go on with your Jesus prayer, or you're reading the scriptures, or your rosary, or the beginning of mass. And then at the end of your prayer time, you see, has your feeling changed? See, the Holy Spirit often acts through deep feeling. They get stronger or weaker the more you pray. So in this case, the way the Holy Spirit would probably respond to this girl is she would start feeling either A, more desire to marry this young man, or B, less desire. And the more she prays about it, if the feeling gets stronger and stronger, or weaker and weaker each time she prays, that's how, usually, how the Holy Spirit directs us. Through a deep feeling, more than, much deeper than passing emotions, a deep feeling that grows stronger or weaker the more you pray about something. And this is directly related to what we have talked about for the last two nights. The Jesus prayer, or any good method of Christian meditation that leads to contemplation, is a way of getting us more attuned to the movements of the Holy Spirit within our minds and within our hearts. And you'll find, and many of you are, are, you know, are serious people of prayer already, you've been praying for years, and those of you who have really been serious about daily meditation, daily prayer, sacraments, you know what I'm talking about. You get more and more uh, nudges, orientation, direction from the Holy Spirit the more you pray about something. And so this is why one reason why the practice of the Jesus prayer is a way of entering into these promises, these quite extraordinary promises that Jesus makes in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John's Gospel. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. This is his will for us, that our joy may be complete. It doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer. I mean, Jesus went through terrible sufferings, and all of the apostles did as well. But they had the joy of the Holy Spirit that, that sustained them throughout whatever difficult times they had to go through. And we, and we can depend on the same sustaining joy from the Holy Spirit in our own lives. Now, I'd just like to... Uh, uh, just briefly review some of the instructions that I gave last night and give you some further instructions. So as I indicated, and by the way, when I finish this little part of the, the um, presentation, I'm going to ask for any questions. If you have any questions or doubts or concerns, uh, please raise them because I always find that when people ask questions, 
everybody profits from the questions. There's, because sometimes we, with some things we haven't even thought of, and someone else has thought of, it could help us get a deeper understanding. So last night I explained a little bit about you know, where this uh, practice of the Jesus prayer comes from. The fi- it finds its inspiration in those passages that I just read in John's Gospel and in other passages in the New Testament where the name of Jesus is presented as the most powerful name in the whole world. At the name of Jesus, every name must bend in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father that Jesus is Lord. That's Philippians chapter 2. And St. John says in his first epistle, he says, the commandment of God is that we are to love each other and to believe in the name of Jesus. So to believe in the name of Jesus, the name, as I mentioned last night, is identified with the person of Jesus. That was the Hebrew, that is the Hebrew understanding of the name, that the name contains the essence of the person. And so when, when we are praying the name, in the name of Jesus, we're calling upon him, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. We're speaking to the person of Jesus Christ who is everywhere and who especially is present in the heart of believers. That's his promise. He made at the Last Supper, that those who love him and obey him, he and the Father and the Holy Spirit will come and live in their heart, in the center of their soul. And so contemplative prayer is a way of turning our attention from the outside, ordinarily, you know, with the eyes open, or even with the eyes closed, we're thinking about the world out there, when we practice meditation that leads us to contemplation, our attention is, is, goes within. And through the repetition of this sacred phrase, Jesus have mercy on me, Jesus have mercy on me, it brings our mind to a quieter state of functioning. And the mind uh, and our attention is drawn inwards toward the source of thought, which is the center of the soul, where God has his dwelling. So by repeating the name of Jesus in this simple phrase, we're kind of like disposing ourselves, making ourselves more available to him as he wants to draw us to rest in him, to abide in him, to live in him. So that really, in a nutshell, is what the Jesus prayer is all about. It's a way of disposing our minds and our hearts to, to Jesus who lives in the center of the soul, to draw our attention to his dwelling place. And w- when he draws us into this more interior experience, the mind becomes very quiet, even though thoughts can still be running through the mind. And the body enters a very steep, deep state of rest as well. And this allows for purification of the mind and the body. Deep rest, physiologically, has a great regenerating impact on our on our mind and on our nervous system. And the rest that we get during contemplative prayer is often deeper than sleep. And so more deeply rooted stress and tension and wounds from the past have more of an opportunity to be healed in this deeper rest as we're kind of resting with Jesus, resting in his presence. It's a way of consciously inviting him to touch whatever in our minds, whatever in our bodies, Whatever in our hearts needs healing. So it's a, you could say, a therapeutic process. And if you practice this, if we practice this, this uh, way of prayer regularly, we'll notice some, uh, some definite healing going on in terms of memories and in terms of even nervous disorders. I, I taught this one sister. She was like in her late 80s. She had a real problem with insomnia. And um, she had high blood pressure. And she started the practice of the Jesus Prayer. Sister Miriam Daniel, who's now in Campbell at their retirement center. And she said she'd been taking high blood pressure medicine for years. And after practicing the Jesus Prayer for two or three months, she went to see her doctor. And he said, are you taking some kind of a new medication? You know, your, your, your cholesterol is way down and your blood pressure is down. And she said, well, I started this new meditation practice. So she credited this, this lower blood pressure and um, lower, I don't know if it was cholesterol, but it definitely was a blood pressure, uh, was, was uh, more normalized through the regular practice meditation, which makes sense if it's releasing stress, and stress often is related to high blood pressure. 
and other diseases, we would expect that this type of meditation would have a very therapeutic effect. Now let me just go over a few of the practical instructions about the uh, proper, correct practice of the Jesus Prayer. The tradition is, and this goes back to even Jewish times, the two main periods of meditation during the day should be before breakfast and before dinner. These are the two traditional times. And in the monasteries, for example, where meditation forms a big part of their lives, like up in the Carmelites, probably many of you are familiar with the Carmelites up here at St. Joseph's, they follow a rule that comes from a reformed rule from St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila that, uh, that mandates, actually, two periods of meditation, in the morning before breakfast, in the evening before dinner. And that's what, uh, what I would recommend to all of us. Now, some of you may think, wait a minute, two periods, 20 minutes each? I barely have enough time to do what I'm supposed to do now. But I'll tell you, I've taught this to hundreds and hundreds of people. And to many young parents who have young children and working real hard and are stressed out. And almost invariably, they, they tell me that if they stick with this practice at least once a day, at least once a day, but preferably twice a day, in the morning to get ready for the day, and then in the late afternoon or early evening to get ready for the evening activity, they accomplish what they need to accomplish with less anxiety, less stress, and more clarity of mind. So it's, even though this is primarily a way to get more in touch with the person of Jesus Christ, he affects all areas of our life. And that's why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be given to you as well. You, you, you are able to accomplish what you, the Lord wants you to accomplish with less stress, less anxiety, less tension, and more clarity of mind. So this is, the, this is the recommendation from the tradition. Twice a day, before, once before breakfast, once before dinner. And it seems to be, for those who are starting off in this practice, 20 minutes for adults seems to be just about the right amount of time to create kind of a balance between our, the deep quiet of meditation and then our activity afterwards. So 20 minutes in the morning, eight hours of activity, 20 minutes in the late afternoon, early evening, then our evening activity. So this is a way of also saying that one of the purposes of meditation is to prepare us for the day, to prepare us for work or school, family life, whatever our responsibilities are. So that we're giving more of our best self and our whole self to whatever is our vocation, our profession, our role in life. For children, uh, like I teach this usually to, you know, to teenagers, so say beginning high school, maybe middle school, uh, I usually say 10 minutes. 10 minutes, maybe if they're older teenagers, you know, like 15, 18, 15 minutes, and then uh, adults, 20 minutes. It seems to be the best amount of best time. We don't want to meditate right after eating, so this would be another important detail of the instruction, because if you meditate right after a full meal, uh, it, it, it feels uncomfortable, because when you're meditating, it's more oxygen is going to the brain, and when you're digesting food, the oxygen is going to the stomach. So it creates some tension. So that's why, again, the tradition is before meals. Now, if you're, you come home from work, you come home from school, you're really hungry, it's your, say, and that's what you've decided to be your meditation time, like four or five in the afternoon, but you're really hungry, you can have something light. You know, take crackers or some milk, uh, just something to cut the hunger, but not to have a full meal a prior, immediately prior to doing your meditation. Now some people ask, well, what about nighttime? Because a lot of people do pray at night before going to bed, which is a traditional practice. We call it compline, or night prayer. And night prayer is usually very simple and short. You start with an examination of conscience, you read a psalm, a short reading, and you go to bed. So that's really not a time for meditation. Meditation is a deeper experience, a longer experience to prepare for activity, and it gets the mind refreshed and, and energized. So you don't want to do that right before going to sleep. So it's not recommended to do your meditation right before going to sleep. However, some people have told me that 
that's the only time they have. Their, their schedule is just too tight and they can't find any other time of the day. And it, and it seems to be, it seems to work for them. They sleep fine after meditation. But I would say, if you can, try it before breakfast and before dinner. And we, in terms of the position for meditation, uh, we, we want to meditate seated Comfortably Now, these benches, I forgot last night, these benches are so uncomfortable, and I had you sit for an hour and a half. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a break, you know, in about 10 minutes, just a short break before we do our meditation. But, you know, find a place that's relatively comfortable and where you won't be disturbed. You don't have to be in a quiet place, but you want to be in a place where you won't be disturbed. And you time yourself with a watch, and you start your meditation, you just peek at the watch, you close your eyes, you wait about half a minute, and then you begin to invoke the holy name, the holy phrase, Jesus, have mercy on me. And you just do it very effortlessly with faith that the Lord's in charge, not you. He's in charge. All you do is call upon his name mentally. We don't do it spoken. We only do it mentally. And then we just take it as it comes. And he knows what he's, what he's doing with us. It's better not to sit in a, a recliner with your head back. You know, sit upright so you're more in an alert position. How many of you, now, how many of you were able to meditate at least once today? Could you raise your hand? Hi, so I can see who, come on, be honest here. All right, most people did, good. Uh, if you weren't able to, well, tomorrow's a new day. How many were able to meditate twice today? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, well, most of you meditated once. And did any of you feel kind of sleepy? Did you or even fall asleep when you're meditating? Okay, a few of you. That's not uncommon because many of us have a sleep deficit. We haven't been getting adequate sleep. And so you'll find that when you do your meditation, if you really have that sleep deficit, you'll probably start dozing maybe five minutes, 10 minutes. And, uh, and that's okay. That's, uh, you know, Jesus said, come to me all you who labor and are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. And we can take that literally as well as symbolically. So remember the, the little flower, Saint Therese de Lisieux, one of the great, great saints of the latter part of the 19th century. In fact, she's right back there. Her statue is right there above the confessional. And uh, when, she would, uh, when she became a Carmelite nun, she would sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament in prayer. And for a period of time, she regularly fell asleep. And it made her feel very guilty. She felt this was so disrespectful, sleeping in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. But Jesus revealed to her, I don't know whether it was some you know, locution, some words, but, or through just a deep feeling, she received the communication from Jesus that he was just happy to have her there praying. And if she fell asleep, that's just fine. And uh, so if you do fall asleep, you know, doze for five or ten minutes, and then we wake up, finish your meditation for another five or, or, or ten minutes. Now some people uh, think that they can only meditate if they have a quiet place. And I prefer to meditate in a quiet place, but it's not, it's not required. And in fact, I lived at Saint at Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish uh, up, up until last year. I, I lived there for three years. And if you've ever been to the priest's house, it's about a block away from the church, there are three little dogs right next to my bedroom, and there's a rooster on the other side of the house. And the rooster crowed most of the day. And the bo dogs barked whenever I started to meditate. They seemed to know exactly when I was going to meditate, and they'd start barking. And... But I said to, my, to myself, well, whenever I teach the Jesus prayer, I tell people you don't need to be in a quiet place and noise is not an obstacle to meditation. And I found that to be true. For the first couple, three minutes, I was you know, pretty irritated at these barking dogs and the, and the um, crowing rooster. But then I just, went, I just kept going back you know, effortlessly to Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on that rooster. Please let that rooster be on somebody's dinner table soon. You know. <laughs> So, <clears throat> yes, noise is not an obstacle of meditation. But you do want to take precautions that you are not disturbed during your meditation. So be sure you turn off your cell phone. 
and tell other people in the house that you're going to be doing, you're going to be in quiet prayer, you know, for 20, 30 minutes so that they won't um, barge in on you. And if you have young children, your young children will be very happy that you, mom or dad, are meditating. I've had a number of mothers, young mothers, tell me that um, when they started doing their meditation, their, their children noticed that they were different after they came out of the bedroom finishing their meditation. And, uh, and, and a few of them had told me that when they didn't meditate and they were a little tense and stressed out, you know, with their kids, that, that one of their little kids would say, Mommy, did you meditate today? <laughs> they notice it makes a difference in your attitude, in your frame of mind. So we do what we can to take precautions to avoid being disturbed. And if you are interrupted, you know, the dog bursts into your room and jumps in your lap or something, okay, you don't curse the dog. You just put the dog outside and just go back to your meditation. But you try to avoid those kinds of interruptions. Those, now, since most of you have already been meditating for a day, uh, at least with this me method, how, how many of you noticed that Sometimes the name, the phrase, Jesus, have mercy on me, seems to change, like maybe it gets faster, slower, louder, softer, clearer, fainter. How many of you notice that? It usually, that usually happens. It, it, it doesn't always happen, but it usually does. That You'll notice it because as your mind begins to settle down, and as your attention becomes more subtle, you're, no, you're at a deeper level of the thinking process, your perception of thoughts becomes more vague sometimes, less distinct, less clear. So at the beginning of your, of your 20 minutes of meditation, you may be thinking very clearly, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. But then after 10 minutes or so, you might find that your mind becomes very quiet, and the name and, the, and that phrase is is less distinct, less clear. And sometimes, have you noticed, it fades away altogether? Did it? How many of you had that experience? The name just kind of faded away. And that uh, is very common, especially as the mind becomes more settled in, in meditation. And, it's, and then sometimes the name will slip away altogether and no thoughts will take its place. You're just quiet, and you're not asleep. Did any of you have any moments like that? Just moments where your mind was just quiet? Yeah, so this is the beginning of what we call contemplation. Which is an experience of very deep meditation and, and, and still. therapeutic to mind and body. So when that happens, usually in the beginning we're only aware of it after it's happened. Like you're meditating, you're thinking the holy name, and then all of a sudden it's gone. The name disappears and no, na and no thought comes to take its place. And maybe this quiet lasts for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, half a minute, and then you, you start having some thoughts again. And you realize, oh, where was I? What was that? If, it's un, it's an, uh, if it is an unfamiliar experience, the experience of just being still, just being quiet, that's probably what was going on. And that experience of contemplation, of inner stillness, becomes more clear the, 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 the more you are uh, familiar with the practice. We don't try to keep a rhythm with the name. We don't try to, we don't in any way try to control the mind. Now, this is a really important point. Please remember this. Don't try to control your mind. Don't try to empty your mind. Don't try to get rid of thoughts. Don't concentrate against thoughts. That will create tension and often give you a headache. So, no, we don't try to control the mind. Now, we don't feed thoughts. You know, you get thoughts about anything. Maybe you have thoughts about, you know, what you want to cook for dinner or where you're going to go tomorrow or a shopping list that just kind of comes out of nowhere. We don't fight those thoughts. We just go back to the holy name. That's all. That's the instruction. It sounds very simple. And it is very simple. So when you're not thinking the holy name, when you're off someplace else, and you realize, oh, wh where was I? You just go back to the holy name. 
Now, in those 20 minutes, maybe you had 15 minutes of other thoughts and only five minutes of really thinking the name. And you think, oh, I'm really not praying. No, that's not true. Now, here's another important point I really, really want you to emphasize. The thoughts that come during meditation, according to St. Teresa and her tradition, are the result of purification. Because when the body enters this deep state of rest, these knots in, in the nervous system, you know, or, or these uh, painful memories from the past, traumas from the past that are somehow lodged in the brain, lodged in the nervous system, they begin to unwind. These knots begin to unwind. And this is something physiological. It's, now, she doesn't use this exact terminology, but this is her teaching, that the body is beginning to get purified through the silence of contemplation. And as the body is getting purified and these knots begin to unravel, that kicks up thoughts. Because mind and body are intimately connected. Something happens to the body, something happens to the mind, and vice versa. So these thoughts, she says, that come during medica meditation are signs of purification of the mind and the body. And so we don't complain against them. And when we realize, when we see these thoughts happening, we just, we don't, we don't feed them and we don't fight them. We just go back to our method of meditation. So this is a very important point because I've taught this to, you know, to many hundreds of people and after, and then I, what I like to do is to meet with the people who learned it sometime in the future to kind of do a little checkup, see how they're doing. And most people don't have any problems. But the one comment that I often hear is, my problem is I have a lot of thoughts. This is, this is common. This is part of the meditation experience. The, it's part of the whole purification experience. So we, we don't expect to have just silence, just stillness. Thoughts will ordinarily be, you know, kind of coming and going, coming and going, and we just don't mind them at all. We just don't mind them. So those are a few practical points that I wanted to raise with you. And just to um, summarize what you do at home. So say you decide, you know, you go to, you go to work, you go to school at 8 o'clock, you usually have your breakfast around 7.30, so maybe you, you start your meditation at 7 o'clock. And... You meditate for 20 minutes, and when you start your meditation, you make the sign of the cross. You say, come Holy Spirit, some little prayer, just asking the, God's help in your prayer time. And then you sit quietly, just with your mind loose, for half a minute, and then you begin to introduce the sacred name, the sacred phrase, Jesus, have mercy on me, after about half a minute. And you've already looked at your watch, you know your time, and then when you feel the 20 minutes are up, you just peek at your watch, and if the time is up, you stop thinking the name inside. But don't open your eyes for two or three minutes. This is a very important point. Don't open your eyes for two or three minutes after you finish your meditation, because your metabolic rate will be quite a bit lower during meditation. And so if you open your eyes quickly, or you get up quickly, it could be kind of a startling to the nervous system, a little shocking to the nervous system. So you take your time for you know two or three minutes, then you just slowly open your eyes and you proceed with your day's activity. And I would highly recommend that you include once or twice a day after your Jesus prayer, the reading of scripture. Have your Bible there and, and start going through one of the gospels. This year we read Mark on Sundays. So you might want to take Mark's Gospel. And you finish your 20 minutes of meditation, you take your Bible, you read slowly, meditatively for five or 10 minutes. It's a wonderful way to bring together this, to this inner encounter uh, with Christ and his word. And you'll get a lot more out of his word when you read it after you're doing the Jesus prayer because your mind is already much more alert to the presence and the, and the power of Christ. So that's, those are the simple instructions. Now I'd like to, uh, before we meditate together, I want to see if any of you have any questions about your practice or any experiences you wanted to ask me about, um, any doubts about the practice. So let me come down in, in your midst.
and our live streaming uh, technician up there. I'm going to start moving around now. I just want to warn you. Okay, can you hear me in the back okay? So, any questions, comments? Yes. Okay, now this is, a, this is an interesting question or point. This a lady says that sometimes after she is praying here in church or after Mass, she uh, wants to spend a little extra time praying. And then these, sometimes these ugly thoughts come to mind. You know, bad thoughts, unpleasant thoughts. So this is not at all uncommon. Uh, and it could be part of the purification process that, that got catalyzed by the prayer itself and these thoughts are kind of like symptoms of these um, disordered parts of your own body and mind being purified. So you don't pay any attention to them. And uh, in fact, um, some saints, like St. John of the Cross, in his book, The um, Dark Night, he says it's a, a common experience for very spiritual people to have temptations that are really ugly, you know, like blasphemous thoughts or lustful thoughts right in the middle of your meditation. And it's a terrible uh, uh, pain for these people who are you know, very strongly seeking God. And sometimes they're demonic. Attacks. They could be temptations you know, from demons. Or simply parts of your own disordered habits that, you're still, that, that still are having influence over you, and you don't pay any attention to them. You just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce this blasphemous thought. Or in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce this lustful thought. Or in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce this anger, this resentment that I'm, is filling my mind. So you don't, you don't look to your own willpower. That's, that's a waste of time. You look to the power of the Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce this anger, I renounce this pride, I renounce this vainglory, whatever it may be. And don't worry about it. Worrying about it is really e egocentric. It means, oh, it's all up to me. It's all up to me to purify myself and to be a good, holy person. No, it isn't. Why didn't Jesus come? Jesus came because we can't save ourselves. Good question. Good point. What else? What other comments, questions, doubts? Yes. Inter intercessory prayer. Okay, two, two, two interesting comments. One is that when Lily was praying the Jesus prayer, she began adding names of people that she wanted to ask mercy for, or ask the Lord's help for. So, Lord Jesus, have mercy on my children, my spouse, my neighbor, whatever it may be. And that kind of prayer is very beautiful and very important. And we should always be doing intercess every day, doing intercessory prayer for, you know, lots of people. And, it's, and, and one of the ideal times to do it is right when you wake up or right after the Jesus prayer. Because, because when, in the Jesus prayer, your mind is becoming increasingly settled in the, the divine presence. And then your intercessory prayer after that or your reading of the scriptures after that is much more powerful. So we don't do intercessory prayer during the Jesus prayer. You could say before you even start, Lord, I offer up this this, this session of the Jesus prayer for my children, uh, you know, for my sick aunt or whatever, you could offer it up before you start. But then during the actual prayer itself, we don't add petitions. The power of this particular method of meditation is its simplicity. 
It's absolutely simple. And I, I do not recommend adding anything to it. Then after you do your Jesus prayer, then you go into your scripture prayer, you go into intercessory prayer, you go to mass. That's the, uh, that's, that would be my recommendation. Second point you made is when you were uh, a kid, you had this Jesuit priest who taught you this very beautiful phrase. I don't remember the whole thing, but it's something like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, you know. Yeah, so these different aphorisms, you know, that we learned as kids, those are very beautiful. My grandmother always used to say, you know, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, you know, have mercy on my family. And uh, so you were doing, it was, that's what came to you when you started the Jesus prayer, was that phrase that you've been saying ever since your childhood. My suggestion is, keep saying that phrase the way you always have done it, but not during the Jesus prayer. That would be a separate prayer. You know? There's many other pr ways we can be praying. You know, I'm not saying all you should do is the Jesus prayer, but I am saying it's, it's a good foundation for other kinds of prayer. Other questions, comments, doubts? Yes. Okay, how would you compare the hypnotic state of mind with the contemplative state of mind? That's a good question. Hypnosis means that someone is suggesting a particular thought to you or a particular state of consciousness, you know, through some, uh, some um, manipulation, you could say. And, uh, but in the Jesus prayer, nobody's suggesting anything. We are simply calling on the name of Jesus and he is in charge of the prayer. So in contemplation, it's the work of God. It's not our work, and certainly not the work of a hypnotist or a psychologist or a priest. It's Jesus. So that's the whole point of the Jesus prayer, is we call upon him, and we let him do with us what he wants. That's it. And contemplation is a state of a settled mind, a quiet mind. In a hypnotic state, you're not conscious. You're not able to control your mind in a hypnotic state. The hypnotist is controlling you, or the psychologist is controlling you. It's a completely different state of awareness. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, you're in, 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 yeah, in hypnosis, you're allowing a hypnotist or a psychologist who's using... That's right, they're guiding you. They're guiding you. But nobody's guiding you in the Jesus prayer. Oh, no, Jesus is guiding you. Jesus is guiding you. See, you're all, you're all. The only cooperation is calling upon his holy name and asking for his mercy. That's it. This is unbelievably simple. And that's why it's so powerful. Because we're not, our ego is not involved. And nobody's suggesting anything to us. We're just. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, so in hypnosis, you know, you're getting a suggestion or you're being led and guided by, your, by a hypnotist to deal with some issues, for example. <clears throat> in meditation, in Christian meditation that leads to contemplation, we're simply resting. We're resting in the divine presence. And, and the Holy Spirit will often suggest things to us afterwards. It will, we're more in touch with the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's very beautiful. Anything else? Okay, well, we're going to do, we're going to have a little, uh, about, let's see, about a little more than 10-minute meditation together. And then I'll end up with a, with a, a brief presentation of where is this all heading us. But would you like just to stand up for a couple of minutes, since these benches are so uncomfortable? Well, I'm glad to hear the, the cell phone. That reminds me to tell everybody to turn off your cell phones as we begin to meditate.
Okay, for our videographer up there, I'm going to be sitting over here on the seat. Okay, when you're ready, just take a seat. <clears throat> and so we're going to begin with that uh, simple invocation that we say at the beginning of the Liturgy of the Hours. If you could just repeat after me, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. And we pray glory be, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So I invite you just to sit comfortably, and to close your eyes, and after about half a minute, begin to think the holy name, the phrase, Jesus have mercy on me, effortlessly. <clears throat> 